Are there constructive things that you can do to help restore a culture of life? Find out next on this edition of Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Brian Johnston is the Western Director of the National Right to Life Committee. He has served in many capacities while advocating for innocent lives. As California Commissioner on Aging, as Chairman of the California Pro-Life Council, on the board of the National Legal Center for the Medically Dependent and Disabled, he is an author and lecturer, a film producer and commentator. And now, here's our host, Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brian Johnston. Today, we're going to talk about an issue that's very present with us. It's one that is pressing upon our society. And as we've said before, we're in a battle of ideas. Don't let these ideas just come at you and be dismissed. Don't forget that ideas that are enforced are called laws. And the laws that are now being entertained in many states, in California, Oregon, Washington, and others, now allow for a physician-assisted suicide. This issue is of critical importance. As you know, I've been an advocate for the medically vulnerable for quite a few decades. I've written specifically on on assisted suicide, the book Death as a Salesman, What's Wrong with Assisted Suicide. Yes, you can get it on Amazon. And yes, the book is better than the movie. There is a movie. It's uh, of the same name, a documentary. You can also get that on Amazon. Today, I want to focus on one very important and narrow aspect of this debate. It's coming to your home. It's coming to your friends and family. If you're not prepared, you're going to get taken. There's several areas. We could easily spend a whole program just talking about the medical ethics. Assisted suicide dramatically changes the medical ethics. You see, this isn't suicide. Suicide is when someone takes their own life. Physician-assisted suicide is when medicine is involved. Physicians are invited to be involved. Physicians authorize and basically provide lethality. We're talking about medicine used as a lethal implement. This cuts to the very heart of what medicine is. This cuts through 3,000 years of medical ethics. In the Hippocratic Oath, Hippocrates had all of his followers swear that I would give no deadly medicine, even if asked. This isn't a new debate. The doctors know a lot about the human body, the ability to use their skill to quickly and the human life has always been available. But if it's now authorized, now the physician becomes a terrifying member of society. We don't know if they're really there to help us, or maybe they're there to simply mm, get things over with. They're the arbiters of how they act. It's very important that medical ethics have a bright, bright fence, making sure that medicine is only used to benefit and never harm a patient. That's a whole program. We're not going to talk about that. But that's a dramatic change in the law when these laws come. The other is the nature of the law. The purpose of the law is to defend the vulnerable, those that can't defend themselves. And you're often told, yeah, but it's that person's decision. Let's assume for a moment that it is that person's decision. Well, we don't authorize suicide. If, If this is a good thing, then why don't we have people at the Golden Gate Bridge that instead of Instead of having to dish bodies out of, out of the San Francisco Bay, why don't we just say, oh, you want to die, we'll kill you. No, suicide is recognized as the number one indicator that there's something wrong emotionally with that individual. It's the number one indicator to psychologists that this is a cry for help. This person is emotionally traumatized. Suicide is inherently wrong. It's also not a right. When they assert that this is a right to assisted suicide, you cannot assert a right that denies all your other rights. Any right you have comes from your existence as a human being. That self-evident truth, that right, comes from your humanity. You don't have the right to end all rights. An example would be slavery. We know that slavery is abolished, but the right to sell yourself into slavery is prohibited. You cannot sell yourself into slavery in the United States of America. For the very specific reason is you cannot deny yourself your rights. There's no right to end all rights. That is a, a, a circular argument. It, it is not a right to take your life. And we do know, as I said, suicide is an indicator that there's something deeper wrong. And just killing someone and giving into it 
is accepting that emotional state when in fact there's other issues that can be gotten to. But that, again, the legal aspect, that's a whole other program. We could spend hours just talking about the legal implications of the right to life versus the right, quote unquote, to assisted suicide. I want to spend just a little time today talking about the concept of assisted suicide. People miss out the real significance of these laws because all this law does, this law doesn't really help that suicide victim. It doesn't help if being dead is a help. It doesn't help them at all. They're just dead. What these laws do, what changes in the law is this, a third party, an outside agent, an assistant is now involved in a lethal act against a human being, facilitating it, encouraging it, making it happen in some way, shape, or form. An assistant is involved in killing. That assistant can walk away without any investigation, without any implication. That's what legalizing assisted suicide does. It frees the assistant. It doesn't free the patient. The patient is simply snuffed. That's not freedom. If it is, then then I guess the Nazis were freeing people in those death camps. If death is freedom, then then they're supposedly free. But that is not a form of freedom. And we'll, we'll explain that later when we talk about pain. That's a whole other issue, the problem of pain, and that you don't need to kill people to end pain. Uh, that is something that medicine has demonstrated long ago. I want to keep focusing on what really happens in these laws. The assistant gets away with killing. That's what happens. And the assistant is often the one that may have the most to gain, even if they're not heirs. But often they are heirs. There's no prohibition on heirs killing in order to inherit. That's not prohibited. There is no requirement where these laws are are put into place that the patient get a psychological evaluation. There's no such requirement. So the emotions of the patient can be easily manipulated. Uh, I have met many of these perpetrators. I spent time with Derek Humphrey. He actually authored the first book, Gene's Way, that promoted assisted suicide. He was talking about the assisted suicide of his wife in England, and he became the leading spokesperson for the Hemlock Society in this movement back in the 80s. I debated him a couple of times. I'm going to tell you his story, and then I'm going to relate those facts. To, to what's happening right now all around us. And you need to understand that in assisted suicide, most often the real beneficiary is the assistant. We'll be right back and you can see the chilling truth of those facts. You're listening to Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, you know that Life Matters is about life culture and the battle of ideas in no place is the battle of ideas more evident than in Hollywood, California. I have on with me Bo Bryant. He's the communications director for the Life Fest Film Festival. Hey, Bo. Hey, Brian. How are you doing? Great. Hey, tell us about Life Fest, what it is and what happens. Okay, so Life Fest is the film festival dedicated to showcasing films that affirm the intrinsic worth of human life and the profound significance of each life. So Life Film Fest is based in the heart of the entertainment industry. It's in Hollywood, California. California, and it takes place every year. So this year, it takes place from May 4th to May 7th, 2017. So that's the first weekend in May. And really what it is, it's about bringing together experienced Hollywood professionals with those just mm-hmm. starting out in the industry so that we can really showcase films that affirm life, life culture, and really engage in the battle of ideas. Awesome. That is excellent. How, how can folks get in touch with Life Fest? We're always looking for volunteers. We're looking for people to sign up. Or if you have a film that you'd like to submit and have it shown there, you can find all of our information information at lifefilmfest.com. So that's lifefilmfest.com. That's Life Film Fest, and we hope to hear more from you, Bo, and Life Film Fest. Thanks a lot. Talk soon. Awesome. Thank you. Find out about the exciting cultural change impacting Hollywood. Go to lifefilmfest.com. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Assisted Suicide. Today we're talking about the real significance of the assistant in assisted suicide and that it's the assistant who's free. These laws don't change anything for the vulnerable patient other than ensuring that they're dead. But they're dead because of the implementation by someone else. 
someone else has brought to bear lethal action against them. It's not truly a suicide. If it's a suicide, then there would only be one person involved. No, it's assisted suicide. I want to read to you from his very first book, Derek Humphrey, the father of the modern assisted suicide movement. Again, I've debated Mr. Humphrey uh, on several occasions, and it's very clear that his motives were a little bit mixed, and he admits as much when he talks about the killing of his first wife, Jean. He describes that she would ask him regularly, Darling, is this the day? Now, again, if you've ever been around someone seriously ill, it's very easy for them to be depressed. It's very easy for them to look to someone else for encouragement and involvement. If we don't respond properly, we can easily send the wrong messages. Gary Comfrey writes in his book, Jean's Way, I asked myself if I should cross-examine her about the correctness of her part of the decision. However, I resisted this because it was so apparent that she was dependent on me for judgment. So we have an admission that his wife was utterly dependent on him for sound judgment, and she would always ask him if she should go through with this. Finally, he said, of course, in love, because always, always, this debate isn't about true ideas, it's about emotions. It isn't about objective facts and how to help someone who can be helped. It's about killing them based on emotions. And he said that he went through with it because to waver would have been wrong. After just asserting it was entirely his judgment being brought into play. But this is extremely common. One of the things we see in assisted suicide is that vulnerable people look to caregivers. A lot of times there's various issues at stake. There's family finances at stake. There's the care of family. If it's, a, if it's a breadwinner, it's going to be so much better if the life insurance can kick in. The whole emotional suffering, the, even if it's not financial, there's a certain benefit to the caregiver that they no longer have to change the chucks, you know, the adult diapers. There's a certain benefit, and we can't dismiss the significance of that. Now, I think what we see in assisted suicide is there's an entire class of human beings that the law says can now be killed. The law is stating there's an entire group of humanity that it's now legal that lethal action be taken against them. They don't die of a natural death. They don't die of natural causes. Something very unnatural is introduced to snuff them, to kill them, to end their life. The problem has been that whenever a society declares a class of humanity to be eligible for killing, for lethal action, that class always grows. We see that again in every jurisdiction. Well, it's only for people who are within six months of death. Honest oncologist will tell you it's impossible to determine that. And you and I both know people who have uh, survived cancer diagnoses. But that's not what happens. In many places, it isn't any longer just those with six months or eight months or 12 months. Or think about it. If this is to end the suffering of someone for six months, if six months of suffering is so terrible, what about someone who has six years of suffering left? What about someone who has a disability that's actually, it's absolutely incurable? They're going to live the rest of their life with that suffering. Why shouldn't we be kind and extend the class of human beings that can be killed to that person? If you're compassionate, you would. If that's your reason, if it's compassion, and the time of suffering, well, then those disabled, and as you know, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Switzerland, that is what's happening. That class of humanity grows. Once you say, here's a group of people that the law will no longer protect, and the law says you can kill, in fact, the law will give you the money, they will pay for the deadly medicine, that class of humanity only grows. And there's a a participant, an outside agent, an assistant, who's implementing or facilitating or somehow causing that to happen. As I said, very often you will find that there's some benefit that can come to that assistant through this act, whether it be financial or emotional. And this is something that's recognized by a lot of advocates of assisted suicide. Margaret Batten is an advocate of assisted suicide and rational suicide. I've debated her several times on radio and met her in person. 
She, again, is a thought leader, again, this battle of ideas. Margaret says that once we do legalize suicide and assisted suicide, it, quote, gives rise to the possibility of large-scale manipulation of suicide and the maneuvering of people to choosing suicide when they would not otherwise have done so. This is the other, darker side of the future coin, she says. Now, she's willing to take that risk. But are you? Should society risk that? That's the very reason assisting suicide has been against the law. It is too easy to manipulate. It is too easy to have mixed motives. Just not having that person around is an incredible motive because ultimately assisted suicide isn't necessarily for those that we care for. It actually is put in place for those we no longer wish to care for. Now, the fact is, is that assisted suicide is romantic to some. It's been romanticized. But this public policy now that's being changed makes it a utilitarian policy. It was uh, for California's legalization. There was a young woman in California. Her name was Brittany Maynard, and she wanted to kill herself. Now, the illness that she had, she had blastomas of the brain, a cancer of the brain, and it was implied that it was incurable. But in fact, at the very time that she was becoming a media sensation, Duke University Medical School had cured that very illness. And I'm not sure if she was told that. And yet it was presented as a romantically appropriate thing to do if you're seriously ill, if you really loved her. You'll also note that Brittany Maynard was one of the few young women that uh, have been presented. And she was used as so often is used in marketing as a pretty girl to sell things, to, to get our emotions sympathetic with her. But we don't know what she was told by her husband, Dan Diaz. We do know this. We know that she had set a date of November 1st and yet, and, and built up to that date for months. It was in all the newspapers. It was in all the magazines. She was going to choose her date to die. The day before she made a public announcement on YouTube that she wanted to put it off, that she would push back the date. She had a change of heart. Yet the next day, we merely got an announcement from the family. She's dead. She went through with it. We have no idea what she was told. We have no idea the kind of counseling or emotional support or emotional direction or perhaps manipulation. We don't know. We do know that she said she was going to push it back, and yet she was dead. So something, something very serious about allowing a third party, particularly if it is a family member, particularly if it is someone who's going to benefit in some way, shape, or form, because ultimately when we look at pushing assisted suicide, as meant for someone we care for, in many ways, it can be used for those we no longer wish to care for. We no longer want this burden. It's going to be so much easier. So the assistant in assisted suicide is the one individual who's free. That's the significance of these laws, is that the one person who gets some benefit, the one change, is you can no longer prosecute, or even investigate an individual involved in an assisted suicide. This has thrown open the door for abuse. We've seen abuses in every jurisdiction, in Oregon, in Washington, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, in Belgium. The abuses are rampant, and particularly because emotions and the emotions of third party can get involved. Life Matters continues after this. Well, you know that Life Matters is about life, culture, and the battle of ideas. In no place is the battle of ideas more evident than in Hollywood, California. I have on with me Bo Bryant. He's the communications director for the Life Fest Film Festival. Hey, Bo. Hey, Brian. How are you doing? Great. Hey, tell us about Life Fest, what it is and what happens. Okay, so Life Fest is the film festival dedicated to showcasing films that affirm the intrinsic worth of human life and the profound significance of each life. So Life Film Fest is based in the heart of the entertainment industry. It's in Hollywood, California, and it takes place every year. So this year, it takes place from May 4th to May 7th. 
2017, so that's the first weekend in May. And really what it is, it's about bringing together experienced Hollywood professionals with those just mm-hmm. starting out in the industry so that we can really showcase films that affirm life, life culture, and really engage in the battle of ideas. Awesome. That is excellent. How, how can folks get in touch with Life Fest? We're always looking for volunteers. We're looking for people to sign up, or if you have a film that you'd like to submit and have it shown there, you can find all of our information at lifefilmfest.com. So that's lifefilmfest.com. It's Life Film Fest, and we hope to hear more from you, Bo, and Life Film Fest. Thanks a lot. Talk soon. Awesome. Thank you. Find out about the exciting cultural change impacting Hollywood. Go to lifefilmfest.com. And now back to more about life, culture, and the battle of ideas with Brian Johnston. Quiet down, please. Please quiet down. Open your books to the English Romantic period. We will begin today with none other than Wordsworth. The battle of ideas that rages around us is communicated in words. Words have meaning, but they are often twisted and intentionally used to hide self-evident facts. Wordsworth is that part of our show that looks at the real meaning and significance of the words we use, and the words often used by others to hide deeper meanings. This is Brian Johnston, your host of Life Matters. And as you've just heard, there's a portion of our program where we talk about the meaning and significance of words and the power that words have. Wordsworth is that part of Life Matters where we examine the implications of the words that are used every day, words that have great power, and sometimes that power is intentionally hidden. Today I'm going to talk about two words, words that have great significance and yet are bandied about very often at very important times in people's lives, at points of decision. One of those words is hopeless. Hopeless. The other is incurable. Incurable. How many times have you heard it said that the situation is hopeless? What's being described when it's called hopeless? Well, hope is not a physical attribute or a physical quality. Hope is actually a, an emotion. It's more a spiritual quality, isn't it? I have a good friend, Johnny Erickson Tata. You may know her. Johnny Erickson lost her ability to walk and to use her limbs when she was very young in a diving accident. And for a while, everything seemed hopeless. But Johnny had a change of heart. And if you haven't read her story, I suggest you do go to Johnny and Friends and learn about her story. And you can learn that there's huge significance to the term hope and the term hopeless. Let's talk about that other word, incurable. We hear that a lot. A couple of years ago, A young woman became very, very famous, briefly, Brittany Maynard. We're told that it was a a private family decision. But wait a second. This was the most public suicide in American history. It was a planned suicide. It was marketed through every media outlet in the nation. Do you know that her suicide was promoted with the money of George Soros? where Compassion and Choices, that's the organization that used to be called the Hemlock Society, they arranged for her to be on the cover of all the popular magazines. She was on the front pages of every newspaper in America because she wanted to commit suicide. It was implied that she had an illness that was incurable. It can't be cured. It seemed like an emotionally good reason for her to simply end her life. But what is incurable? First, I need to tell you that that illness that she had, that blastoma of the brain, is very, very serious. But do you know that science and medicine is continuing to progress and address these serious issues? The Duke Medical Center actually has 
brought people into remission that had exactly the same blastomas. But we waited months because the announcement was made. We were marketed with the hopelessness and the emotions of this attractive young woman. These ideas were sold to us as a culture and paid for by George Soros. But, you know, Johnny Erickson taught us situation is also incurable. And Johnny Erickson Tata is just one individual. There are millions. All of us will face difficulties in life. All of us will face challenges, and often with our loved ones and family. You must be prepared to understand the language that's going to be used. You must be able to cut through to the real meaning. You must be able to understand that if we take life and death into our own hands, we're doing something that both medical ethics and the Christian faith have taught are very, very dangerous things to do. I've been in many nursing homes in California, and I've been a hospice volunteer as well as commissioner on aging in California. I need to let you know that if you're ever in a situation that you or a loved one are in pain, and the doctors are not dealing with that pain, the answer is simple. It's three words. It's not kill the patient. Get another doctor. The resources are there to deal with even the most difficult physical pain. The deeper issue are the emotions. Be prepared for the emotions. Be ready to counsel with wise counsel. Be ready to give an answer because this is a battle that's coming to you. We want you prepared on the issues of life. Learn more about everything in today's show online at lifematters.life, where you'll find all the resources you need to protect life. Subscribe to the Life Matters podcast, where we have even more information on this and all the life issues. Go to lifematters.life to subscribe. Listen to more Life Matters every Saturday at 1 p.m. right here on KCBC. KCBC.